I think I must have been born with a justice uh, gene. My name is Sheila and I first got involved with Amnesty when I was in transition year. Karen Clifford, uh, Campaigns and Activism Manager. Mariam Hosseinha from Iran. Matthew Newding and I'm in the Wesley Amnesty Society. I'm Wesley Alwyn Schlepper. I joined Amnesty in 82. Ruja Fazeli, and I've been involved with Amnesty for probably about nearly 10 years. I'm Elizabeth O'Connor-Poo, and uh, I'm a member of the uh, Northwood Club Amnesty International Group. Peter Dunn. Colin O'Gorman, Executive Director, Amnesty International Ireland. Always I wish uh, oh, uh, I can uh, work with Amnesty. It was the first year of secondary school, and we had a, a maths teacher who spent more time talking to us about issues like uh, opposition to nuclear power and human rights that he did about maths. My parents moved to Burma and after that I kind of had my eyes open to the, you know, um, people just having absolutely no human rights. It was general human rights, especially to do with women's rights. Within my school I actually set up an Amnesty Youth Group. I've been involved with the Rangu for the past year. Well, I suppose I've been always been an activist even in my students' day in Germany. I suppose as a German you're always uh, uh, aware of the terrible human rights violation that happened in Nazi Germany, so you always say, you know, you have to try and prevent it happening again. It was just something in, in the background when I was growing up in Belfast that Amnesty seemed to be the only organisation at that time that would make any noise. At the time, the amnesty office was on the 10th floor or so in Liberty Hall and uh, they had about one and a half room and one and a half uh, fully employed people. An urgent action would have came probably from the IAS to the Irish section by post or by telephone call or by fax. They would then post it out to us and then we would post it off to the target area. An urgent action now is probably somebody sits in an office, gets an email in, sends an email out, and five minutes later you've got an email going off the government somewhere. We have to keep writing letters, uh, signing petitions, clicking on, on, on a mouse if that's what it takes. I'm always astounded by how ordinary people, you know, peasant people in many cases, uh, stand up to people who are trying to take away their human rights, and uh, it just it gives you a great deal of courage. The campaign that we're still working on is the death penalty case of Troy Davis. Our activists have really uh, become very engaged, including a group of retired nuns. Last year we had his sister Martina came over and spoke to our members at annual conference and for me that was one of the most powerful personal moments I've had since I came to work with Amnesty. Troy's story is not an isolated story. All of us can be Troy Davis in the four. All of us can be Troy Davis if we have mental illness. All of us will be Troy Davis and we're drug addicted. And we printed up some shirts for Amnesty that says, I am Troy Davis. I've been in airports walking past people with I am Troy Davis shirt. And they're like, do you know about the case of Troy Davis? And I just smile. She also went out to Cabra to visit the nuns. One of the nuns, in fact, is like 91 years old and has been writing to Troy for about 12 years. It's frankly horrifying and disturbing to think that he could finally uh, be executed. In one of the execution dates we actually got within two hours of it being carried out and the, the biggest concern I had was how I was going to convey the news to our members here in Ireland. It doesn't mean all hope is lost uh, and we are continuing to campaign on Troy's behalf. Kali Jarvatat, no charge, no trial, uh, Palestinian in an Israeli prison. We'd get the campaign letter signed outside the GPO and his lawyer brought in a little campaign card that we had, one of the letters that we were getting signed. He got such a tremendous lift from it. It boosted him morally. It let him know that he wasn't what he was told he was, which was a, a terrorist. So it, it's coming to his six months review and I think he's, he's been in prison about two years at this stage. I'm sitting in the kitchen where I have my computer and I get an email to say that He's on his way home and we've won. And that it, even now thinking about it, I'm, I'm getting choked up, but that's brilliant. Iran has become a, a country of focus for us here in Ireland. I moved to Ireland when I was about 12 years old from Iran. Knowing about the situation of young people my own age back in Iran, I felt that maybe um, I should try and raise their voice here. Bahara Hidayat, she's a student activist and women's rights activist. She's extremely, extremely um, 
brave and she's this beautiful young woman. She was arrested uh, a day after her wedding and it was on her birthday as well. Even from prison she manages to sometimes send messages. There's the Mod United Nations conference where it's like the mock United Nations. They, had, they needed a guest speaker and Amnesty Society, with the Wesleyan Society, decided that they were going to get Mariam Huzanka, who's in the Iranian group, who was a prisoner of conscience herself and who had been campaigned for to come and speak at the Mod United Nations conference. I was a journalist. I wrote about uh, human rights. First time I was a uh, four day in prison and second time I was 45 days in prison. Uh, they were a uh, thiefer, murderer and uh, drug addiction. Uh, first uh, day uh, really, I really uh, scared and I can't uh, sleep. Uh, but after that uh, when uh, we start chat uh, and I knew their uh, story uh, I realized that there are people three years ago, in, I, uh, I think maybe near 10 of them hanged and I knew them. When I uh, left Iran, uh, Iran's uh, regime arrested my husband. They uh, came to my home. My home uh, was uh, one safe place uh, and whole world for me. And after that, uh, I think, oh, <laughs> I don't have anything. And you could definitely see from the people's faces that were at the conference uh, how inspired they were by, by what her story was. It can happen to anyone and you know having been involved in Amnesty and having, uh, hearing the stories of young people my own age, you know, there was a guy who was you know, blogging about human rights issues, he was 18 and he got arrested over his blogs. We even did where we kidnapped our minister during assembly uh, to highlight the kidnapping of the Iranian opposition leaders. We told people that we need to get 500 signatures or it wasn't going to be released. And thankfully, by lunchtime, we got 500 signatures, which we then gave to the Iranian group, which were signatures for the Iranian opposition leaders that they sent off to Iran. You hear stories of women like Nasser Institute, who is such a, a, a prominent lawyer in Iran, and she's always taken very controversial cases of you know, uh, young people who had been executed, juvenile offenders. She has been given death 10 years um, in prison at the moment. She has two young children. Well, Amnesty started to work on Aung San Suu Kyi as a prisoner of conscience not long after her arrest and detention. Emma, obviously her dad is the British ambassador to Burma, so she's actually had the honour of meeting Aung San Suu Kyi. She wouldn't really not necessarily talk about politics, obviously, to me, because I'm just a secondary school student, but she's just, she's always very willing to talk about anything that you're interested in. I mean, we spent about a good 10 minutes talking about Harry Potter. It's only a year or a little more ago since uh, I was in Croke Park when uh, you two presented Amnesty's Ambassador of Conscience Award. And all the work that they've done, Amnesty has done, I know, but the U2 concert, and then I know also they had the masks that they got people to put on. It was so meaningful for all of us, I think, as members of Amnesty, um, and as passionate human rights defenders when she was finally freed last year. When I saw she was released, it took her a whole 20 minutes before the crowd would calm down to let her speak. So many people had worked for so long right across the world with huge determination to, to work for her freedom, and we succeeded. She never failed to say how grateful she was to all the international organisations, including Amnesty. So we decided to make a book of letters, necessarily, to give to Aung San Suu Kyi on why she's been inspiring to so many people, and we've had a lot of people sign it. Human rights is as much about what goes on in our individual lives, you know, and the lives of people around us. It's not a bad news that you're going to hear. There are there are a lot of good stories to hear. There are a lot of good things that do happen. People really do uh, and can make a difference. When three million people speak with one voice, they have to be listened to. Sometimes I think it's uh, like a family. The struggle for dignity and mutual respect is just as great in your individual lives as it is in the big worldwide campaign. We're here 50 years. Uh, there's an awful lot more to do. Uh, we can't give up yet. I'm proud every time we put human rights on the agenda. Amnesty works. I think it's just important not to lose hope. I just feel that uh, there's so much evil in the world. Uh, at least there's one organisation that goes out to uh, do what it can and do it very effectively for the uh, rights of people throughout the world. My best experience in my life. Thank you for all that you do and happy birthday, Amnesty International.